Welcome to SciComm Monday. I'm your host, Nicole Wood. Uh, for those of you new to SciComm Monday, we encourage as much engagement as possible. So uh, feel free to send in your questions via the chat module on uh, SciComm Monday. And if we don't get to any of your questions or to all of your questions today, actually, uh, feel free to uh, either tweet myself at SciComm Monday or at my personal Twitter handle of Wildlife Biogal. And then additionally uh, with our guests as well. And so with that, I'm going to introduce today's guest. She's Jenna Ng, a PhD candidate from the University of Alberta, all the way up in Canada. And she works with Phrygianus hawks. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Janet to the broadcast. Thanks for being here, Janet. Thanks, Nicole. It's so nice to be here too. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your uh, background with everything, uh, a little bit about your academic history, like how did you get to where you are now? Ooh, that's a good question. So I am, I think I grew up probably a biologist. I didn't realize that was the case until I think probably high school when I was watching probably like a nature documentary and they were talking about cool things like cougar and elk and deer and they interviewed this guy that um, had like the byline in the corner of the of the image and it was Dr. So-and-so, wildlife biologist. And it was like, wildlife biologist is a real job? And then from there, it was basically pretty, pretty on track. Um, I did a bachelor's at the U of A and uh, I studied deer vehicle collisions and kind of what habitat, what does the world look like around places where deer vehicle collisions happen. Um, I went on to do a master's uh, at the University of Regina where I studied common nighthawks and home range and habitat uh, questions, again, where they live, what's good real estate. Um, I was an environmental consultant for a couple of years as well too and I also ran a nonprofit um, for a few years uh, and so kind of, um, yeah, tried a few things and um, ultimately went back to do a PhD a few years ago to study Phrygianus hawks at the University of Alberta. Great. Uh, that's quite a, a vast history there, so a lot of different things. I was, was thinking that you did all, you know, ornithology work, but it's neat to see that you also have some mammal work as well. How do you think that's uh, helped you with uh, your current work? That's a good question. I mean, I've done, I've done a smidgen of mammal work. Um, and I've been really lucky to go out with friends to kind of tag along for some mammal work as well, too. Um, definitely most of my work has been focused on birds, though. Um, but it's always nice to see how other people do things, how other people frame questions. They might be very similar questions, but there's always more than one approach to understanding why and getting at that answer. Um, and, and I think it's important to be well-rounded as well, too. Uh, it makes you a better listener to people um, that are doing work other than that's different from yours. Um, and it also just brings a fresh perspective to what you're doing as well, too. Um, I mean, there's sometimes when I'm chatting with people and I go, you do what? That is bonkers. And then I immediately go to my computer and jot down a note uh, so then I can try something similar, but with birds uh, and the prairies. Neat. Yeah, like that's one of the things I always liked because um, I, I, you know, I came into grad school thinking of myself more as, you know, uh, a terrestrial uh, mammal uh, person and then to end up diving into wetlands. It's really interesting to see the questions that I've been able to bring because of like my experience tracking bobcats versus actually going and chasing around birds. So I think it brings a, a fresh perspective to the field that you're in. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing now? So Phrygianus hawks, I have to admit, I never heard of them before I met you. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Phrygianus hawks are super cool to start off with. Um, they are North America's largest uh, Budio species. That means it's North America's largest soaring hawk. Uh, only things that are bigger are things like condors and eagles. Um, how big is a Phrygianus hawk? Well, the females can be up to two kilograms. Um, so then think of that as like two jugs of milk, I guess. Um, and their wingspans can be up to five meters wide. 
Um, and so to give you some context for that, a female ferruginous hawk's wingspan is as wide as I am tall. So they're really big birds. Um, they specialize in open country, and so they like to be able to have like those thermals that go through the air, and they can catch those to soar and keep an eye on things. Um, and they really, they generally eat things that are like ground squirrels and gophers, prairie dogs, and jackrabbits, um, and those sort of like subway sandwich-shaped mammals basically kind of make up most of the biomass of their food. So do they eat other things besides mammals or is that like, like you said, the, just the majority of it, you know, like kind of what percentage would you guess at like, you know, as far as like their mammal consumption versus other things? That's a good question. So almost overwhelmingly they eat mammals, small mammals, but not the real, not often the really small guys like deer or deer mice or voles. They tend to go for the juicier, again, subway sandwich sized, mm -hmm. sized critters. Um, some of the work that I'm trying to get at is understanding where birds decide where to live. So what kind of habitat they live in. Okay. Um, and, and as most animals are, I know I'm certainly in this boat as well too, we're driven by our stomachs. And so what some of the work that I've been doing is trying to understand, um, I, did a, I would do a lot of hawk surveys in the spring, I would take a lot of historical data, and I would build these habitat models, essentially these statistical models that predict where birds are going to live. Um, and since doing that, then I'm trying to understand, okay, so what makes this piece of real estate so awesome? Um, we've long known, other people have shown, that ferruginous hawks are very closely tied to their food source. So if ground squirrel populations go up, ferruginous hawk populations tend to go up as well too. If prairie dog um, populations in that area go down, so do ferruginous hawks. So they're closely tied to their stomachs. But then we're trying to also separate out um, where these animals are found relative to where hawks are found as well too. So some of the neat things that I've done is um, um, <laughs> it, it's a good character building part of the field work that we've done. Um, so we actually put tiny little video cameras up near hawk nests. Um, we have two cameras, we have one pointed right at the nest and one at the side just to give two different perspectives. But what we're trying to do is capture video feed of what type of food um, birds are bringing back to their nestlings. And so then we often have a ton of video footage, actually about 40,000 hours of video footage across almost 100 nests of mama and dad hawks bringing um, ground squirrels and, and whatnot in. So I'm trying to understand if this nest is living in a landscape that has a lot of cropland, or if the next nest over is living in a place that has a lot of beautiful native grassland, does uh, the type of food they bring back change, and does the frequency, so how much food they bring back change as well too. So those are the, some of the things I'm trying to tackle that relate um, food, hawk food, back to where they live. Um, overwhelmingly what we found is that, yeah, they really like ground squirrels where we live. Over 96% of their biomass of the food that's brought in is usually ground squirrels, especially juvenile ground squirrels, because I think they're, they just don't duck down the hole fast enough, or they're not really listening to the parents when the alarm calls come up. Um, and so they're overwhelmingly juvenile ground squirrels that are brought back to the nests. One of the neat things, though, is that we found with this video footage, um, because again, there's a long history of study that have shown ferruginous hawks eat ground squirrels, and if there's prairie dogs around, eat prairie dogs. And so the first time we saw one bring back a baby shorebird, we were like, what is the thing with the long legs and the big feet? That doesn't even have a real tail on it. What is that? Mm -hmm. And so we actually found, and we actually had some uh, undergraduate students working with us on this question, which was really exciting and really cool. Uh, they help us watch video, and we do a little study project with them um, and try to publish it. And we're kind of working on this right now. So what they found was that birds that are nesting near wetlands, like really productive wetlands, the ones that you drive up to and are just full of birds, if there's a hawk nesting near it, then the hawks are like, yeah, I'm totally going to go eat those. And so again, baby shorebirds don't really duck down fast enough. They don't really know what they're looking for, and they make an easy meal. And so we actually find that birds that nest by wetlands bring back more shorebirds and even waterfowl as well, too. And so we have a couple of nests um, and some video footage that show uh, mama hawk or dad hawk bringing back like mallards, <laughs> which are really big ducks, um, and pintails, uh, which are also really big ducks. And they just drag them onto these nests and then everybody has a huge feast. Um, some of those hawk nests, when you walk up to them, the first thing you notice are a bunch of little duck wings underneath the nest as well too. And so there's birds that just like, they aren't dummies, again, they're tied to their stomachs. And so if they see an easy food source that's there, um, they're gonna, going to take advantage 
advantage of it. We had one Ferruginous Hawk video. We have a set of videos where they just bring three ducklings back, one after the other. Oh, wow. And so, you know, so, so you can kind of know that um, you can you can probably guess that it's probably the same little brood that's like like so ever so calmly casually paddling around the wetland when they just get picked off one by one by fruginous hawks um yeah it's a little dark sometimes but it's very interesting right. um because again we never would have expected them to take in waterfowl and shorebirds but hey it depends on where they live they're going to take advantage of the food that's around them well i mean it makes sense i mean if there's that huge food source there why go fly for something that might take more time and more effort to get? If you can just snatch a couple baby ducklings, there you go. Yeah, um, yeah that's right. Oh, so I had put up a video uh, showing you guys uh, uh, going and putting up a nest. So kind of walk us through the process or putting up a nest camp. So kind of walk us through the process of how do you go and find where the nests are? Like, where are the nests? And then how do you go through the process of actually setting up these cameras? Um, okay, so we do a lot of spring surveys. Uh, so Virginia's hawks usually get back to their breeding grounds in late February, March generally, and then they're usually laying eggs and on eggs by last week of April uh, and throughout April. The incubation period is about 30 days. Um, and lucky for us, Frugia's hawk nests are enormous. They can be as small as, oh, the size of like a large laptop maybe and you know like a little thicker built up of twigs and branches um, or they can be six feet tall and five feet wide like eagle nest or osprey nest size um, the other advantage too is that they live in the prairies and so there's not a lot of trees in the prairies and if we go out to start surveying for them before the leaves come out like when everything is just sort of branchy looking then you can actually see fruginous hawks from several hundred meters away and you can take a spotting scope and figure out who's sitting on the nest we always joke that our crew of field um, field techs Perfusion on our Perfusionist hawk crew is that we're the best people out there at identifying hawks from their foreheads and up. Because again, it's April, it's windy, it's cold, it's stormy. They're gonna all these birds are gonna be hunkered really down on these really low on these big nests in the distance. And so we can we know all the characteristics of how to identify a hawk from basically the nose and the eyeball and up. Um, so like from 1% of the body. Um, and so then we identify the bird, find the nest, and we keep track, for, track of it week after week. Um, we either check from a distance using our spotting scopes or binoculars, or once the, the young are at a certain age or old enough that um, the parents can, it's not, not safe to have a parent off for a couple of minutes and we'll go up with what we call a peeping pole. It's a really high tech piece of technology that we use. Um, it's basically an extendable painter's pole, those big yellow ones that you use to like paint your walls with. And we put a point and shoot camera at the top of it and set it on to video mode. And so when we actually go up to the nest, we walk up to it, we set, start the video, we poke at the peeping pole kind of up and point it down into the nest, sort of do like a full sweep so you get a view of it, bring it back down, and then count heads or count eggs from the video footage. Um, and so it's a very low-tech way to get some really valuable information for tracking reproduction or nesting for Prusina's hawks. Um, and then from then, we basically pick out candidate nests that would be really good for cameras. Um, again, we have a very specific study design. We want to know where they're living and how that influences uh, nesting, nesting success and things like what food they bring in and how much. So that means we pick some nests are, that are in uh, lots of grassland, all the way to nests that are in lots of cropland and lots in the middle as well, too. Um, and then really importantly as well, too, we have to pick nests that we can actually climb up to or like really close near to um, and there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of trees on the prairies that are very very old that were planted in the early 1900s or have been growing for several hundred years as well too so you can imagine that some of those branches and some of those trees are not in the healthiest condition and we do not climb those trees um, there's a lot of nests that we can get to just by propping a ladder up but there are some cases where we actually have to rig up all the climbing equipment and getting all of our slings and anchors climbing helmets its carabiners, um, ascenders, and so forth. Um, and then we try to be as quick as possible. We put these two, again, tiny little lipstick-sized cameras up around the nest, uh, and they connect back to a DVR box. So these are essentially the same cameras that um, convenience store places use, CCTV cameras. And then the most brutal part is climbing a tree is actually really fun, and kind of getting a close-up view of the nest is really fun. But the brutal part 
that these systems run on four marine batteries or 60 pounds each. Um, and so basically by the end of the summer, everybody on our crew is super ripped because um, we're always carrying 120 pounds of batteries at one time, but that's two sets of 120 pounds back and forth. And sometimes the nest can be pretty far from the road as well too. Um, and so if you ever have come out to do field work with me for fun, I'm really sorry if I ever made you haul batteries with me. But as you can understand, I needed all the help that I could get. Yeah, I know with uh, my field work towards the end of it, I'd always have these really ripped shoulders and upper arms from uh, raking all this uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. It just it comes with the territory. It's it's a nice thing of like when you do any sort of outdoor science, you get that physical component to it. So, but then of course when we're in the lab, just you know analyzing all of our data, all that you know good workout just kind of like dive bombs off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I understand completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, what else do you guys uh, do besides monitor the nest? Are, are you, uh, when you're up there, are you able to ban the birds? Are you putting transmitters? Are you, what else are you monitoring with the birds besides just the actual like eggs and young in the nest? So we try to keep our time and disturbance of the nest as short and as low key as possible. So if we're putting up a video camera that day, then we're only putting a video camera up that day. Um, perhaps a week before or a week after, even a couple weeks after, depending on what's on tap, then we uh, have a, a master's student that was studying um, post-fledgling habitat and survival. And so then that means that she was tracking birds um, after the baby birds, after they left the nest, and to see where they went, what type of habitat they use, and how well they survived there. Um, it is a really tough life being a baby Frugianus hawk that's just fledged. Um, they're still dependent on the parents. They stick pretty close to the original nest, which is good. But there's just everything in the world is just trying to eat them. And so we actually found that 50% of baby birds that just left the nest, 50% of them would actually die most of the predation within three weeks of leaving that nest. And so then if you think about how susceptible or how vulnerable they are on their first migration down to the wintering areas and then back, there's actually a lot of concern to try to understand what's going on in those other parts of its life as well too, because they get hammered so hard right after they leave the nest. This is pretty normal for post-fledgling birds or baby birds that have just left the nest, um, but it's always, it's always eye-opening just what's out there to get you if you're has in white letters uh, or field readable. So the silver band is the tiny serial number. You won't be able to read that unless you have the bird in hand, which is usually pretty rare. And it's usually only in the case if you have it, um, if you found it, say, roadkill, or in the lucky circumstance, recapture it elsewhere. The field readable, the alphanumeric ones, are meant to be read through binoculars and a spotting scope. So this means that other researchers or ourselves, or even birders, can actually report that code to the National Banding Office and then get information back on where that bird came from. Um, so banding is a big, important part of it. But we also, um, she also put on VHF radio transmitters to track them. So these are like basically tiny VHF radios. Kind of instead of CBC, they play little beeps that we can track through the landscape and see um, what habitat they use and how long they survive for. So the post fledgling part is really important. Um, from then on, we also have another student, um, Cram Nordell, who just defended his master's last year, I suppose. Yep. Um, and he was studying... Um, what it meant for human disturbance, what, it, what does it mean for fruitionist ox? And so he was studying specifically what makes a bird come off the nest like a parent. Because when mom is sitting on that nest, it's so important that she stays there and protects them, keeps them warm, keeps all the threats away. And so if you flush a bird off, um, so whether it's a person walking by, a car driving by, um, or some industrial activity that's going on, then it's important to know at what distance does that make a difference for those birds. Um, Jesse Watson is another master student that's on our crew as well too. Um, he has been trapping hawks since I think the time that he could walk with his dad. Uh, he's a, a biologist down in the States. And so he's been putting satellite transmitters onto these birds for the last few years. And I think we've got over 45 hawks um, tracked and currently tracking 
a handful, a large handful as well too, maybe two handfuls, I'm not sure. And so that's really fabulous and important because then we're understanding where adult birds go, how they spend their time on the home range in Canada and the breeding range, but then also where they're going down uh, during the migration time, where are they stopping on the way during their migration route as well too, and then where they come back to or how often they come back to the same spot. Uh, so if you're following me on Twitter, we've been posting a couple of tracking maps to actually show uh, where birds are relative um, to their spring migration, which is so cool because Jesse and I are like sitting in, he's sitting in Salt Lake City and I'm sitting in Edmonton, um, all comfortable indoors in front of our computers. And we have these data like flowing in about where these birds that we've tagged are like actually real time and like how far away are they from the breeding grounds and how worried Nick are the newest master students doing field work as well too. Nick, the birds are coming. Are you ready for field work yet? Um, and this, all this information is at our fingertips and it's all through satellites and tracking birds. It's, it's, it's amazing. So like you said, they'll winter down south. So where exactly is it that the birds in your area are wintering down south at? Uh, good question. So it's really neat to see where birds end up in the winter. Um, so up here in the breeding grounds, they're breeding in north or southern Alberta and southern Saskatchewan. So kind of far apart, but like sort of at least like rough, rough, roughly the same area. Um, we've had birds winter in California. Baja of all places, lovely place to be. Um, and we've had them go through and spend time in the Oklahoma Panhandle, so in Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma. Uh, a lot, quite a few will winter in Texas, and then quite a few will also uh, winter in northern Mexico as well, too, sort of areas that are like the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, so again, they're nesting in places that look relatively similar to uh, southern Alberta and southern Saskatchewan, where again, they're an open country species, so they're generally in kind of open shrubland, shrub step grassland um, and desert systems where they're always going to have those thermals to, to catch on, to soar. Um, they're going to have those subway sandwich sized small mammals to eat as well too. Um, and then some places to sit and perch, to hang out, to be vigilant and to hunt from as well too. So the conservation status of these birds, uh, how are they doing? Uh, is it, uh, are they doing just fine? Are they threatened or endangered? Uh, what issues are affecting those particular statuses? Is that status, um, I read somewhere that they may be threatened but may not be. Uh, that always um, depends on what scale you're looking at too. So can you tell us overall what their status is and then also in your particular area too? Yeah, good question. So unfortunately with ferruginous hawks, their populations have declined quite a bit in the last few decades. Up here in Canada, they've declined by over 50% since the mid-1990s. Um, for any animal, that is a huge number to drop by. And um, so what happened is that they were listed as a federally threatened species and a provincially, in Alberta, provincially endangered species. And so this affords them certain um, legislation to help predict, protect them, uh, to conserve them, and to help with recovery actions. Um, and we've also seen a considerable range contraction as well, too, which is also dangerous because, again, up here in Canada, it's in northern range. We can't see that shrinking anymore uh, without potentially losing ferruginous hawks from their Canadian range. Um, down in the States, they are a species of conservation concern. Um, on for a lot of states uh, wildlife action plans as well too. I can't remember the exact number, but it's overwhelmingly the majority of states that do have fruitless hawks, either during the breeding or the non-breeding season, have listed them as a species of conservation concern. Uh, they've been actually petitioned a couple of times to be added to the Endangered Species Act in the states as well too that haven't gone through. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of um, thought that like, we need to get more data together to try to understand whether or not that maybe needs to happen again to see how far it goes. But they are declining essentially range-wide throughout Canada and the United States, and they're being, and they're being monitored very carefully um, because certainly we don't want to see them decline any further, and we want to be able to try to understand maybe why they're declining as well too. Um, that's partly a lot of the work, how a lot of the work that our group is doing got started is because we got, whoa, okay, so they're endangered and they're threatened species up here in Canada. What's happening? Why? And what can be done to stop it? And so that's how we have a number of these different students. We've had a postdoc. We've had two uh, principal investigators essentially put together a research plan to tackle lots of these burning questions. Is it climate change? Is it industrial activity? Um, is it landscape change? And um, is it during the adult... Um, 
migration or wintering grounds? Is it during the post fledgling? Is it the nesting season? Uh, so that all of these things are meant to meant to comment on huge. Um, we probably don't expect to either because we have studied all sort of the major aspects of fusion song ecology. Uh, but what we are finding is that there's always a little few pieces here and there in each of our analyses that, um, a little, that are a little bit more negative than we would have expected. And so it might be an example where it's death by a thousand cuts, where it's a little bit of um, negative pressure from this. It's a little bit of negative pressure from this. One of the things that was so surprising for our group um, was that we found that over 8% of the nests each year are actually blown right out of their trees. And so when I talk about these huge nests being six feet tall and five feet wide, they can uh, accumulate a lot of water during storms. They can collect a lot of snow as well too that might make them heavy. Um, they're also just really top heavy and really susceptible to wind. And so then in combination with these trees that are super old and have a lot of dead branches, then that's what we see is that there's always just one branch that must be holding it together and under the right stress, that whole nest can flip out. And we're actually seeing nest mortality, we're seeing nest site availability go down because it's not there the next year. Um, and that's 8% of hawk nests each year. So for us, that was a surprise. And while A, we know this is pretty natural, this has probably been going on for thousands of years, but it's a little bit concerning as well too because the climate change forecast that we have is for um, storms to be more severe and for storms to become more frequent as well too. And so then we're now trying to understand what do those forecasts mean for these nests and how they toss out. Is, are the nests going to toss out more frequently and does that have a population effect? So it's a lot of little pieces that are being put together to try to answer those types of questions. Yeah, that was one of the really interesting things that I was reading uh, before the broadcast was the impact of climate change and how those storms are going to be intensifying and increasing. And so the impact it will have on a bird that you might not necessarily think of virginous hawks being the poster child for climate change impacts, you know, like you would a polar bear, but it can still have some very devastating impacts. It can have an inland species that you might not otherwise think of because of the other impacts that climate change has on uh, the overall climate. So I want to switch gears slightly because I got to get this in before we're done with the broadcast, but we're going to talk a little bit about Psycom. And I noticed, what was it, last month? I don't know. I think it was like when you're in SciComm, one day seems like it was a week. So what was it, earlier this month when it was the actual living scientist and you had this really uh, amazing photo of you uh, holding one of the hawks. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about your experiences with SciComm, how it has impacted you, and any, um, any advice you might have for anyone interested in SciComm. It's a really, really good question. That was a bonkers day. I feel like that was a bonkers day for anybody, any scientist that was on Twitter. Um, yeah, this like photo that's a few years old now um, was taken when I was being trained how to trap hawks. And it was a fabulous day. Going to hang out with these really, really wonderful raptor biologists. Um, we caught a bunch of birds, put a bunch of satellite transmitters out, um, and somebody snapped a photo of me as I was about to release one. And I think I just rode the Twitter wave on that when I got in early, and the lots of people were really interested. And one of the fabulous things that I came out of it that came out of it were um, a lot of questions from the general audience. And so, you know, I interact. A lot of scientists on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's just here at work, on Twitter, at conferences, and so forth. Um, but to get questions from the general public, as wide as the general public is on Twitter, so well represented, it was really, really cool. Because A, it means that people are interested in the work I'm doing, which is always exciting and a little bit validating as well, too. Um, but it also means that the work that I'm doing... Um, is going to communicate it out farther than just the scientific community. And especially sort of in the political climate that we see now, there's a lot of um, threats and vulnerabilities that we see to natural lands and to wilderness um, and just even like the pockets of wilderness that we see out there as well too. So if people are engaging in the science, the evidence-based work that we're doing, that we're all doing on Twitter, um, and gaining appreciation, and I think having a dialogue with people that are doing it gains trust in the science, 
gains appreciation for the science as well too. Um, and I think getting people excited in those things is really valuable for all of these reasons. And so to ask questions, I didn't ask me anything for a couple of hours on Twitter, and I got questions like, what's my favorite bird? That was the hardest question ever. Um, but they asked me lots of questions about my research and about birds and hawks um, and ornithology in general as well, too. Um, and it was just super, super fun. Um, and so, yeah, science, SciComm or science communication, I think is so important to my first supervisor for my master's program, Mark Brigham, uh, at the University of Regina, was always a really big proponent of it. And part of his um, justification for other than it's important because it's important, but a lot of uh, a lot of the science that's done out of universities is funded in part um, by taxpayer money. So up in Canada, we have things like NSERC that um, taxpayer money goes into. Um, there's NSF in the States and other, um, other grant um, uh, pots of money as well too. And so when we are doing this research that somebody deemed as important that we're spending taxpayer money on as well too, it's absolutely part of our job to then convey what we find and what we're doing to the people that are funding it as well too. And so it's essentially part of the contract um, that Mark would explain that um, we need to go explain to the taxpayers how their money is being spent, why, what, the, what are the implications of the work that we're doing and why might be an important and affect them uh, or improve their lifestyle or improve um, our knowledge of science or whatnot. And so I guess that was part of my mentorship when I was um, doing my master's and I still agree that it's super important. It's also super fun. Scientists get really excited about their work, especially graduate students get kind of like ingrained um, and we kind of get like trapped in our bubble of things as well too. And so to get an opportunity to talk to other people like SciComm Monday is so fabulous. Because um, again, you get to tell somebody about your work. That's really exciting. Yay! Well, I think so. I mean, so many times we hear about these big name animals that you like uh, uh, watch a nature documentary and there's always your lions and your tigers and the other big huge. But to be able to hear about a species you might not have known about otherwise, it's always so great to be able to hear about these lesser known species and learn about them and to learn just how amazing they are. They just haven't had that big publicity yet. So that's um, uh, one of the things that I've always liked about being able to talk to other scientists about their work. And you get to learn some really cool things that sometimes that has, even has impact on your work, you just don't realize it until you hear someone like, oh, they interact with my animal and I never realized that, or that somehow their impacts are like down the line going to impact my species. Uh, so it really helps to educate you as a scientist too, but, uh, I, but educating the public too. Uh, you guys had the fun, you know, for a really long time with some scientists, uh, or science, how should we say this, uh, muted science up in Canada, and we in the States are, uh, you know, facing that possibility, so hopefully we can take all the lessons you guys have learned from that muted science and be able to keep the voice of science, uh, scientists down here, so that way we don't get muted and the public can still learn about these amazing species. That's right, I absolutely agree. Well, I see that we are starting to go over time here, so if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to tweet us things. I want to say thank you to Janet, and I'll start putting up all of our Twitter handles, but Janet, thank you so much for talking to us about your work, and anytime you want to come back, if you're like back out in the field or you're just doing some really cool work, we would always love to have you uh, back on. Awesome. This is really fun. Thanks a lot, Nicole. You're welcome. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to get a hold of Janet, you can tweet her at Janet Ng Bio. If you want to get a hold of the broadcast, you can uh, tweet us at SciComm Monday. And if you want to get a hold of me personally, you can tweet me at Wildlife Bio Gal. Uh, just a reminder that next week we'll be having Abby Lawson on. She's a PhD candidate from Clemson. Uh, her research deals with alligators, so we're going to be diving into reptiles next week. So make sure you tune in for that. And then for anybody else out there who's interested in being on the show, uh, if you're a scientist and have uh, some fun research that you want to share with us, uh, please feel free to tweet us and we'll talk to you about uh, having you on because uh, we do really want to try to uh, share as many scientists uh, and their amazing work as possible on SciComp Monday. 
So with that, we're going to uh, sign off, and I hope you have a great rest of your Monday. Uh, go out, explore, do some science, have some fun, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.